regarding minority participation in sports management, the inter internationalization of professional sports, and the implication of the proliferation of sports opportunities on the economics of sports. I actually have to turn this on. How about that? I'm not going to repeat what I just said. It certainly doesn't warrant it. Sports are clearly extraordinarily important in the United States and throughout the world, not only as a source of entertainment, but as a source of identity for institutions, communities, nations, colleges, and universities. It is also an increasingly important sector of the economy, both because of the billions of dollars of revenue generated from sports events and also because so many goods and services are advertised through the vehicle of sports. As sports have become more important in the world economy, the rules regulating sport have become more complicated and the institutions that, enf that enforce or are affected by these rules have become more public and more controversial. The Center for Sports Law and Policy promotes study and debate about these rules. The topics under consideration today are exciting ones and Duke Law School is a particularly appropriate place to sponsor a conference that examines them. One of the co-directors of this center is John Weistart, who shaped the sports law field, beginning with his casebook on the subject back in 1979. Dorian and Jim Coleman have represented professional athletes, and through one of these representations, they became experts on the subject of doping, which was the subject of an earlier conference of this center. And of course, Paul Hagen, who has organized this conference, has taught, lectured, written, and consulted widely in college and professional sports. And I, I want to take a moment to especially thank Paul Hagen for all of his uh, work and his expertise in organizing and carrying out this conference. As a school, we are also fortunate to have a number of graduates and friends in professional sports as players or former players, owners, sports agents, and lawyers in the industry. We are pleased that two of our graduates, Len Simon, class of 1973, and Bobby Sharma, class of 1998, are here today as panelists. And I just saw another one, uh, Jay Billis, uh, come in just a minute ago. Two other panelists, Arne Tellum and Lon Babby, represent, I'm told, roughly 80% of the Duke athletes in the NBA. And of course, the man who guided the college basketball careers of these athletes is another of our panelists today, Duke's own Hall of Fame coach, Mike Krzyzewski. Before I turn things over to Paul, I also want to acknowledge and thank Tom Werner, owner and CEO of the Boston Red Sox, it's the one, the one professional team uh, that I've visited a game of. Um, <laughs> but I'm promised a ticket to a second, am I not? Where's Tom? This summer, another one. Um, Tom and his son Teddy have been very helpful, I know, to Paul in pulling together this event, and I very much appreciate their time and support. This is a short conference, so let me not use any more of your time for a formal introduction. I am delighted to have you here. Um, welcome to this conference. Please participate, enjoy, and I look forward to meeting some of you later at the reception following this conference. Paul Thank Hagen. You, uh, <clears throat> Before I introduce the participants in the conference, uh, I want to recognize the contribution of two students uh, Eddie Moss and Teddy Werner, who have participated in every aspect of the shaping of this event. Uh, their contribution is, for me, an example of what our very talented students can accomplish whenever we give them the opportunity. Uh, thank you. Um, now, as I was thinking about introducing the panelists, um, I, I thought about Woody Allen's uh, film, Zelig. Uh, and in that uh, film, the Pope appears on the balcony of his own basilica, and the crowd cheers, uh, but wants to know who the person is who is up there on the balcony with Zelig. Uh, I fear that my attempt to introduce the participants in this conference uh, may meet the same response. Um, although I'm speaking at my institution, you may all be wondering who the guy is up there with Tom Werner, Gene Orza, Rob Manfred, Arne Tellum, Lon Babby, Ken Rosenthal, and Len Simon. Uh, these are people who should need no introduction, uh, and in any case, we've included their bios in your, uh, the materials. Uh, Tom Werner, who is going to be um, uh, addressing us uh, in the opening remarks is the chairman and owner of the Boston Red Sox 
And for this audience, he is uh, a particularly important figure because in addition to his many other fine qualities, uh, he is an important consumer of legal services. <laughs> so, um, Rob Manfred uh, is the Executive Vice President of Labor Relations and Human Resources uh, for Major League Baseball and has been a central figure in guiding uh, Major League Baseball's uh, labor negotiations. Uh, Gene Orza is the Associate uh, General Counsel of the Major League Baseball Players Association, which has consistently been uh, the most effective and aggressive of all of the um, sports <laughs> labor unions. Um, Arne Tellum is um, president of uh, SFX Basketball and executive vice president of SFX uh, Baseball. Um, he represents, among many others and uh, important figures, um, Kobe Bryant, um, Jason Giambi, and as will be critically important in our next uh, panel, uh, uh, Hideki Matsui. Arn is also um, on this panel to make sure that the most commonly represented undergraduate college is Haverford, um, uh, something that's important to me on this activity. Lon Babby uh, is uh, a partner and head of the sports representation group at Williams and Connolly. Uh, Lon represents um, a couple of our uh, most important uh, basketball players, including um, uh, Grant Hill and uh, Shane Battier, um, and uh, was formerly uh, the general counsel of the Orioles, and so has been on both sides of many of these uh, issues. Uh, Ken Rosenthal. Uh, is a uh, senior writer uh, at the Sporting News and deals, I think, exclusively with baseball matters. Um, Len Simon, who will be moderating the first uh, panel, um, is a partner at Milberg Weiss in San Diego and is heading up San Diego's uh, effort in dealing with the Chargers' relocation uh, issues. Um, Len is also a graduate of Duke Law School, and when he was a student here, helped to put together the first course in sports law, and I think inspired John Weistar to uh, develop his initial treatise. Uh, in the second session, uh, we will be joined by Bobby Sharma, who is a 1998 graduate of the law school uh, and is director of legal and business affairs for the NBA uh, Developmental League and also by uh, Duke's uh, Hall of Fame men's basketball coach, Mike Krzyzewski, who will be uh, coming over here about three. Um, I'm Paul Hagan. Uh, I'm professor of law here at Duke and co-director of Duke's Center for Sports Law and Policy. Um, I'd like to turn this over now to uh, Tom Werner for his thoughts about um, his career in baseball and the direction of the sport. Thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you, Dean Bartlett. And uh, I'm just going to uh, talk for a few minutes. I'm here as much to um, listen to you and to learn and, and to learn from the uh, other people on this panel. So I'll just try to set the table. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm probably one of the few people in this room who's not a lawyer. I was trying to think of what I could say that, uh, you know, what, how does baseball and law uh, connect with each other. And I realized that one difference between baseball and law is that if you're caught stealing in baseball, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I come from the comedy business, so it's OK to laugh, you know? <laughs> Before I was in uh, uh, baseball, I was a uh, producer of a number of television series. So my, my angle is also to try to uh, make the best of things. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, I bring to this conference is that I uh, uh, was once an owner of the San Diego Padres, which is a small market, and I'm now one of the owners of the Boston Red Sox. So I have been able to view baseball not only uh, from a, the perspective of what has happened to baseball since 1990, but from two uh, quite different perspectives. And uh, um, 
it was very tough uh, managing the, the San Diego Padres in the early 90s. Uh, at one point, um, I uh, was uh, uh, responsible for trading away a couple of high-priced ball players, which ended up ironically helping the San Diego Padres win a, uh, a pennant a few years later. But uh, the fans are always very much sort of um, focused on what, what, what you're doing for them currently. And I remember driving into Jack Murphy Stadium in 1992, and there was a big sign at the entrance saying, honk if you hate Werner. <laughs> <laughs> and I honked because I didn't want to be uh, <laughs> perceived as... <laughs> as <laughs> um, Baseball, uh, everybody, uh, uh, at least those of us associated in baseball on this panel, um, are in love with the game. It, those of us who, who work in it in any capacity um, know that um, it's an extraordinary institution. Uh, I think uh, it's longevity. It's as much, someone once asked me, uh, what if I was going to put things in a, in, in a capsule in terms of what America what it means to be an American in, in uh, the 20th century, now the 21st century. I think that America is uniquely about certain things, and one of them is baseball. And those of us who work in it really are privileged to do so. And um, part of my, the joy that I get from working in baseball, especially in Boston, is that it really means something to uh, young children and to generations of people. We decided last year at one point to ask any parent to throw a ball to any child at Fenway Park and uh, 26,000 people came to Fenway Park on Father's Day to do that and you can feel in New England that, that the Red Sox mean more than just you know what a normal sports team means to a community. It means so much. So from our, from our point of view, uh, as, as responsible custodians of the Red Sox, it's more than just wins and losses because we know we touch everybody in a very special way every day. In 1990, when I came into baseball, it really was a very different uh, 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 Polaroid. Um, the average player's salary in 1990 was uh, $489,000. And today, the average player's salary is about $2.5 million. Uh, to give you sort of a sense of, the, uh, of how uh, costs have, have escalated, my payroll in San Diego in 1990 was $27 million. And we recently picked up Pedro Martinez's option for 2004 at $17.5 million. So one player was almost 60% uh, of our entire payroll just uh, uh, 13 years ago. That doesn't mean that, um, uh, that this is all uh, problematic. As a matter of fact, the reason that baseball salaries have escalated is that the game is more popular than ever. Uh, Seventy million people uh, went through the turnstiles in Major League Baseball in uh, the last season. And if you count the number of people who went to minor league games, that's 110 million people. So there's an extraordinary amount of people who, who attend baseball games. And uh, television ratings are strong. Um, they're not quite as strong as the NFL, but uh, there are reasons for that. And um, on any given night or, or day in, in New England, um, our average uh, telecast gets about an 8 rating or a 9 rating on Nesson, which means uh, that 9% of um, all people in, in New England are watching a Red Sox game. And on any given night when the Red Sox are on, it's the strongest uh, televised event. But there are a lot of challenges. Um, challenges come, um, if, if you own a, a sports franchise, they come not just uh, in the competition that you have uh, in terms of, of what other uh, sporting uh, events uh, your customers might go to, but uh, with the growth of the internet, with the growth of uh, home video, with the growth of uh, the movie business, with the growth of uh, leisure time activities. We're really in a very competitive environment. When I produced The Cosby Show, um, there were only three channels. Uh, th and now, in any given household, you've got, you've got 100, 100 different uh, viewing options. So baseball has to compete uh, in, in a very, very crowded environment. And it's very important to, for us, as um, people who want to grow the sport, to make sure that we're doing everything possible to uh, 
to grow revenues in this environment. And growing revenues is, is something that is, uh, is, is challenging given um, what needs to be uh, done, not just on the field, but off the <coughs> field. The, 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 uh, the person who might own a, uh, a, a basketball uh, franchise or fr a basketball team has very different uh, challenges than uh, someone who owns a baseball team because you see the 25 men on the field, but beyond that, the, uh, the average baseball team has to run a minor league system. Um, they have to uh, grow their players. Very few players go from college to... Uh, to um, uh, the major leagues. And in fact, one of the things that is very positive about uh, baseball as it goes and looks forward in the 21st century is the, the interna interna internationalization of the game. In fact, I saw a statistic that said that 50% of the people in the minor leagues are uh, people who uh, have been born in countries outside the United States. So I consider that to be a great opportunity for baseball. Um, as the country uh, uh, becomes um, more diverse, uh, one of the things that we talk about constantly is how to market our game to minorities, uh, especially w we have a great opportunity to market the game to uh, Hispanics because that's such a, a growing <coughs> uh, demographic in the United States and certainly a, a very important uh, part of, of any baseball system. So we do have we do have great challenges. Uh, I know that uh, uh, we'll be probably touching on the subject of payroll disparity in baseball. Um, clearly, uh, when you have uh, one franchise like the New York Yankees, whose payroll is uh, above 150 million dollars, and another franchise like the uh, the uh, Tampa Bay team, whose whose payroll uh, is less than uh, Alex Rodriguez. Th this is an issue that, that, you know, not only needs to be talked about, but needs to be dealt with. Um, and I've seen both sides of that, so I can argue, argue that for uh, a long time. But uh, it's very encouraging that this last August, the um, Major League Baseball owners and uh, the uh, Players Association did come to uh, an agreement without the uh, pain of a lockout or a strike. And I think that the, uh, the uh, cooperation that uh, led to that agreement is hopefully a, a harbinger of, of uh, cooperation going forward. Because I do think that the internal strife in baseball has certainly been uh, distracting and, uh, and uh, unproductive. So that uh, there are all sorts of things that we're talking about doing together. And, and I look forward to a great period going forward where uh, Baseball uh, just gets stronger and stronger. So um, I'm uh, happy now to turn the uh, conference back to <coughs> Paul, and thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Tom. Um, Len, if you want to lead us off on our panel. OK, so. let me try to get the discussion going and get as many of you involved in it as, as quickly as I can. I want to start where Tom started, really, with the great American game of baseball motherhood, apple pie, baseball, and all those things, and ask whether uh, baseball is working at the present time. Let me put a couple of facts on the table, and then let's get some probably different reactions to it. Uh, fact number one is that the Blue Ribbon uh, panel on uh, the game of baseball issued a report about a year or 18 months ago that demonstrated pretty conclusively that up to that time that the teams in the first quartile of salaries dominated the playoffs and the World Series uh, over the years they covered, which Gene or somebody will probably correct me, but I think it was about 10 years, 10, 12 years of data and showed that teams like the Yankees uh, were uh, dominating the <coughs> playoff and the, and the World Series and teams uh, like the Pittsburgh Pirates or Chicago Cubs or San Diego Padres or whoever tended to miss the playoffs every single year. So one question presented is, are we leaving a lot of teams, players, and fans out in the cold because they uh, are playing for or cheering for or watching teams that have no chance to succeed uh, in any given year? Uh, second fact that I throw on the table since, a not, I guess a presumption in that question is that it would be nice if everybody had a chance when the season started at least, or everybody had a chance every two or three or four years in a little bit of a rotation. Second presumption that I 
that I would come to is that the owners of baseball are in it to make money, and they might be in it to have fun and to enrich the uh, cultural and and uh, uh, educ and entertainment lives of their cities, but they also would like to make money or at least not lose money hand over fist. And I have as my exhibit, being a litigator, I always like to have exhibits. I have as my exhibit the latest issue of Street and Smith Sports Business Journal, which has a headline some of you can see over here, which says Yankees expect to lose thirty million dollars this year. Now, the Yankees, one would think, would be one of the stronger economic entities in Major League Baseball, and if they're losing thirty million dollars a year, one could question whether baseball is working as it ought to work. So I guess the first question I will throw out there, and I'd like to start with Rob Manford if that's okay, is are the economics of baseball broken? And is the latest collective bargaining agreement <clears throat> part of the solution, part of the problem? Uh, where do we stand with the economics of baseball? Well, l let me start by uh, saying that I, I think it's important when you think about a uh, unionized industry like baseball is to, to understand that the process of economic reform is precisely that it is a process. Um, the, the, the way that collective bargaining works necessarily means that um, change will take place in increments as the various interests represented by labor and management are accommodated in, in new agreements. Um, I think the last two collective bargaining agreements have represented significant efforts uh, by the bargaining parties to deal with certain economic issues that face the game, um, really the two that you alluded to, competitive balance and, and the, the profitability of the clubs. Um, let, let me say a word about competitive balance in, in particular. In the last agreement, when we made the 94 collective bargaining agreement, we had a revenue sharing system in baseball that Tom will remember that moved about $20 million in aggregate and virtually no money in the National League. It was almost all American League sharing. Um, by the end of the 94 agreement, we were transferring $169 million from the top of the industry to the bottom. And I do believe that change made a difference. I don't think, for example, last year the Anaheim Angels would have won the World Series were it not for the fact that over the preceding four or five years they received transfers in excess of $40 million under the revenue sharing system. They simply would not have been able to keep that team together without those transfers. Um, I think the new agreement is important in that it builds on that revenue sharing system. Not only does it transfer more dollars, uh, but it also corrected some structural issues in the system that I think we both agree um, will make the, the, the revenue sharing system uh, uh, better during the term of the agreement we have going forward. In addition, you know, for the first time um, in a number of years, we, we reinstituted a form of payroll regulation designed to, to try to address more directly the payroll disparity that exists in the industry. So, so I think that um, when you think about the economics, while there are issues and there will be issues in baseball as we go forward, I think the collective bargaining process has been responsive and has produced change in the system that will help stabilize the economics and, and, and the competition on the field as we go forward. Gene? Agree? Disagree? Well, to some extent, both. I, I think that um, the first thing we should do to try to get a healthier economic picture is to tell Gene Bartlett that one does not visit a baseball game. One goes to or attends a baseball game and spends money. Just visiting is very, very... Uh, <laughs> that, so, that, so, that, that's so not good want, for anybody. So you want Tom to charge her for a ticket? Well, again. Absolutely. I'm, I, I pay for them, and she should too. But, but, but more importantly, she should stay a while, not just visit. Because visit I visit my mother, but I don't. You know. um, <laughs> competitive balance is a subject that, by its very nature, I think, demands more time than this distinguished panel, distinguished also in terms of sheer number, um, uh, demands. But uh, you know, in the last 15 years, the National League has had 10 teams playing for the World Series, and the only duplication really was Atlanta's five. Giants, I think, back in 89 and uh, last year. But since then, every other team has been different in the National League. Um, the effects of the 94 strike on competitive balance can't be uh, uh, underestimated. Uh, 
what, what, what a strike does is it hurts initially small teams, not big teams. And uh, the Yankees were best able to withstand that strike, and teams like Minnesota or Montreal or Pittsburgh were, and Kansas City were less likely to. But Rob is quite correct. I think the amount of revenue sharing that we do um, has contributed mightily, I think, to an enhanced competitive balance. And as Rob says, it is a process. Having said that, no one should underestimate the profundity of the question about revenue sharing and what it means. A large portion of the value of franchises is in the value of the franchise. What you spend is a little bit like an artwork. Uh, you could say that by spending $600,000 for that Degas, you've lost the opportunity cost of that money, and it's not gaining you anything, but it is sitting on your wall. There's some certain psychic uh, value to it, perhaps. But the bet is that since art really hasn't gone down that much since Titian, that you'll recoup it on resale. Now, when you change the revenue streams of Major League Baseball clubs, teams purchased on the basis of a perception of what the revenue streams are going to look like, and you change them, so to speak, midstream, you're, you're doing some pretty substantial violence to uh, some operating assumptions that people who have spent a lot of money uh, uh, operated under. So uh, before I might have had this much in revenue stream, and now I only have this much in revenue stream, what you've done is when I sell that franchise, substantially undermine my ability to recoup the costs that I thought I was going to be able to recoup upon sale or upon reorganization. Uh, that's not to suggest that you went into it with absolute rights and, or insulation against the reordering of the revenue arrangements of the clubs. But basically what, what, we, what we're dealing with now is a simple recognition on the part of the clubs, and I understand it fully, I think, that uh, if we knew then what we know now, we would have ordered our relationships differently. And uh, what they know now and what they didn't know then was going to be the explosion of local television revenue. It's interesting to hear people talk about big markets and small markets in sports as opposed to big revenue teams and small revenue teams. It will come as a surprise to the people who work for the Bureau of the Census that Boston is a big market, but San Diego is a small market. What they really mean is that Boston is a bigger TV market than San Diego is a TV market, because in fact the size of the metropolitan area of Boston is dwarfed by the size of the metropolitan area of San Diego. The best illustration, of course, of that principle is in Atlanta, which happens to be a small market team in one sport and a big market team in another sport, but it's exactly the same city. So these are, these are important distinctions, I think, that have to be uh, emphasized. Having said that, I agree 100% with Rob, though this is a process. We will address these questions as collective bargaining, through the collective bargaining process as time goes on, but no one should uh, uh, believe that everything they read in the newspapers is, is, is a sincerely held view in the collective bargaining process. The Blue Ribbon Commission, I think, had some understanding of what its role was going to be in the collective bargaining process. It fulfilled that mandate, and we responded to it as we thought best served our members' interests. Uh, I want to hear from the agents in a minute, but first let's ask somebody who has no horse in the race at all. Ken Rosenthal writes for the Sporting News, which I think is called the Bible of Baseball. Now, you, you, don't have a, you don't have a rooting interest in this, so tell us about it from either the standpoint of the fans or the standpoint of the world at large. Are you concerned about competitive balance in baseball? Are you concerned that the Yankees might lose $30 million next year? <laughs> I'm not sure I believe the Yankees will lose $30 million for the first part of that. And competitive balance is a very tricky equation, as Gene said. There are teams that don't have great revenues in this sport that are very successful teams and have been over the last several years. And these are the teams that are the best managed low revenue teams. And we're talking about the A's and the Twins in particular. Now, do they face unique pressures and are they unable to keep their star players all the time? Yes, these are absolute problems. The A's are gonna lose another great player after this season most likely. But through good management, development of farm system, these things, they've been able to sustain some level of success for some period. And it's not an insignificant period. This is a series where They've had three straight playoff appearances, and they could be working on a fourth right now. The Twins are another team along those same lines. The Indians now and the Blue Jays are adopting the same kinds of strategic approaches in which they're stripping their payroll down some in order to build back up again. At the other end of the spectrum, you have teams like the Mets and the Dodgers, and I guess to some extent the Red Sox, although they've been more successful, who have spent a ton of money over the past several years and have not won. So there is that, and I think sometimes in this discussion, the idea of good management gets overlooked. At the same time, there is no question that the Yankees possess advantages that the Kansas City Royals can never even dream about. And 
I think the new agreement goes as far as they could have gone toward addressing that. And it was historic in that sense that <clears throat> peace was reached, which was something that was very historic in this sport, and that it went beyond what Rob said, the first agreement went. It, there was a significant level of progress, an increase in revenue sharing, the idea of a luxury tax coming into play. The problem right now, I think, is that the luxury tax does not seem to be slowing down the Yankees one bit. And there are all kinds of ways to address this, some that aren't really discussed very often in the context of the collective bargaining situation. I've always thought, and economists constantly tell me that a third team in New York would go a long way toward undercutting Steinbrenner's spending power and the Mets to a certain extent as well. And these are the kinds of things, these kinds of solutions, I think, are ones that the game should address and look into in the future, what to do with the Expos, how to ensure that the Kansas City Royals spend their money. There's no provision in the agreement that calls for a minimum payroll. The Kansas City Royals can literally take the Yankees, the money that they're getting from the Yankees, and pocket it. And that, to me, is a problem. And I know the union even has opposed the idea of a minimum, sal a minimum payroll at times because it's restrictive in a free market sense. But at the same time, there are a lot of things I think that can still be done to help squeeze it a little bit, bring the higher teams closer to the lower teams. Well, you've led right to my next question, so let's get Arn and, and Lon to weigh in either on the general subject or more specifically, I'd like to hear from you since you represent players in more than one sport. We, we've been talking about baseball, and Ken said that, that was as far as they could have gone in that collective bargaining agreement. Of course, they could have done what the other sports do, which is to impose a salary cap, which is a radically different... <laughs> 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 Gene wasn't going that far. The, the, the medical school is over that way if you need uh, I was for nitroglycerin help. But, <laughs> but, 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 but on a serious note, I mean, the, the more radical way to get the more radical way to get to a competitive balance situation where, for example, the Yankees' fifth best starter is probably more credentialed than the Padres' number one starter would be to impose an NFL, NBA kind of salary cap. So let's talk about the general issue and more specifically Let's compare a salary cap regime with a baseball luxury tax or whatever you guys call it regime. Well, just to follow up on baseball uh, first before I get into what gives me a heart attack as well as the NBA salary structure uh, and rules. In baseball, uh, if you went back into the 1980s uh, and go back and read the, you know, all the sports sections of that you know, era, they were talking about, could baseball survive in Seattle? Could baseball survive in Atlanta? Could baseball survive in Cleveland? They were talking about possibly contracting in those cities, moving the franchises. And it goes back to Ken's point, but over the next decade, they had incredible success. And while money is important, I think what is the most important with any successful team is management, marketing, scouting, the brains of the organization. Today, the Angels, the A's, the Phillies may have a resurgence, the Twins have been successful because their management is smart, their scouting is good, and they've been able to identify young players and use the system. The baseball rules are still geared for a smart organization who identifies talent early to sign their players up when players are very inexpensive, give them security, which is what all players want, and seek. It's not about maximizing value, but they seek security, a sense of belonging, recognition, and control over one's life. That is equally important to a player, even more so to a player, than just making top dollar. And those teams have capitalized on the way the baseball system has worked to lock up their star young players. The A's, talk about pitching, have three of the best pitchers in baseball. They have Tim Hudson, Mark Mulder, Barry Zito. They've been able to sign these players to long-term deals at a time when they could get them inexpensively and they've locked up the future of their franchise. And now they're one of the most competitive teams. So you can do it, and it shouldn't be underestimated. You can talk about revenue sharing and all the economics that Rob and Gene can address, and that is a process. And they're trying hard to make it improve. But at the end of the day, it's about management. It's about who's running the show and identifying talent and locking up your talent. And, and as the Dodgers and some of these teams who have signed, and the Mets who have signed expensive veteran free agents, are now proving also that signing veteran players may not be the smartest thing to do in the future. It may be to, to, that you should focus on the younger players. Uh, so I think the baseball system does work. Uh, and I think it is geared to those teams that 
know how to do those other things, that are, which is the core of baseball, which makes it a great game. It's the competition. It is evaluating players, making smart trades, identifying talent early, and, and keeping your core, identifying what is your core players, and keeping them locked in. Um, in basketball, um, I think, while the, it's interesting, the average salary in the NBA is higher than in baseball, and they all point to how you know, that, that that's a great win for players. The, uh, the NBA salary system, is, from a player's perspective, I think is, is, is terrible. Um, and, and the pendulum has swung just way too far in favor of the owners. In the NBA today, there is a team salary cap, there is a rookie salary cap, there is a veteran salary cap, there is a tax that operates as a hard cap for, on teams if you go over a certain limit. And there is an escrow, notwithstanding the fact that owners are willing to sign professional players to contracts and pay them a certain amount that's specified in the contract, the league and the union have agreed, notwithstanding that contract, the players are still going to give back 10% a year to the owners, notwithstanding what the contract says. Um, there are no options for players because there's a hard tax now in the NBA, there's no free agency. And I think at the core of any labor agreement for players, um, there needs two principles. Players have to have a system that is fair. There has to be objective standards in determining what one's value is. It can't be a, because someone ha sits in the all-powerful seat of being an owner that they can dictate someone's salary. You have to have some standard that you can go to. And in baseball, there's two, there's two processes that, are, that make it at least a fair system. In arbitration, after three years, one can go to a neutral arbitrator and have and, and argue what comparable salaries are. You can look at the industry. You can look at your peers. That gives a measure of fairness. You can, you can look at an objective standard. In basketball, there is no such procedure. Finally, in baseball, after six years, if you played six years in the major leagues, you have the right to be a free agent. There is meaningful free agency. You can go out there and see what your options are. In basketball, there is no arbitration, and now there is no meaningful free agency. Because of the card cap, the tax, it is, the players are basically at the whim and mercy of their owner. And that's not a fair system. So it negates all aspects of what a player wants in his career, fairness, control over one's life. So somehow that system has to be readjusted back to giving the players some say. So if by chance you're lucky enough to go to the Lakers, you know you're going to be treated fairly. But if you end up with the Clippers, or you end up with the Hornets, or you end up with some of the other teams that are very tough to deal with, then you're at the whim of what that owner wants. And if you don't get paid by that owner, you have no other options to go to, or you're going to face a salary cut. That system doesn't work for the players. It may work for David Stern, and it may work for the owners, but it doesn't work for the players. And it's an abortion, in my opinion. Um, I have a unique perspective, having been the general counsel for the Orioles for many years and being responsible for their play apparel in 1989. In 1988, the Orioles lost their first 21 games, and the best part of that was a Pepto-Bismol commercial that we did. Um, uh, in 1989, the Orioles went to the final weekend against the Toronto Blue Jays, and the payroll that year was, I think, $9 million on opening day, uh, which at the time I was very proud of. Now I represent players, and Grant Hill signed a $102 million contract, as did Tim Duncan, who will be signing one soon of that magnitude, in which they get paid more each year than the entire Orioles. Uh, salary was 19, payroll was 1989, and I'm proud of that as well. I guess it follows the, for those young budding lawyers here. One of the things I learned as a young lawyer from Ed Williams was, no matter what, the lawyers go to lunch. Um, so you know, you, have, you do your job as you see it at the time. One of the things that I, I think Arn is absolutely right in his in his summary. Um, one of the things that I think is a misnomer about uh, competitive balance. There are many ways in which the basketball system uh, defeats competitive balance because it places a reward often on the wrong things. Because the system is so unforgiving and so myopic, you really often are put in a position where you have to lose for a number of years. You have to set out to lose for a number of years in order to succeed ultimately. That is not a system, to me, that promotes competitive balance. There are deals made in the salary cap sports, football and basketball, that make no sense uh, other than from the salary cap standpoint. The, the most abusive example of that this year was the Orlando Magic traded a player, a pretty good player, 
to a team and paid the team to take the player. So they traded the player and paid the team to take the player. The only reason for it was to clear salary cap room. They were bribing somebody to take the player off their hands. Now, as from a fan's perspective, I don't see how that is a healthy system. So, uh, and no system that rewards the LA Clippers $30 million for being the most poorly managed franchise in all of professional sports, and I have the unfortunate uh, uh, circumstance of having three players on that team, <laughs> it, is, it is an abomination, uh, and I'm happy to say that publicly. And they uh, will make a $30 million profit this year uh, because of the system. They will be recipients of luxury tax money because of the way they operate their franchise. So from my perspective, having been on both sides of the table in two sports, it is not at all clear to me that a salary cap system, certainly the one in the NBA, which has, is completely myopic and arcane in many, many respects, is a solution to the problem. One final point on this, and this is something that I've learned in working with this, and I don't know if Arne's had the same experience. The whole purpose of the salary cap in theory is to help, is to form a partnership between players and teams so that they will together grow revenues. The system is now has the tail wagging the dog because the NBA prohibits any cooperative activities between a player and his club. And I've run into this a number of times where we try to do joint charitable activities or joint business activities. They think everything is a violation of the salary cap. And if you're putting a penny in the player's pocket, it violates the salary cap rules. They become so uh, strict about that that in essence they are defeating the very purpose of the rules. So that's a different perspective on it. Tom, Tom Werner, do you want in on this debate? And when you get in, could you also address the question of ticket prices? You have a lovely ballpark up there. Fenway, I've been there many times. But I think you have the highest average ticket price in Major League Baseball. So weigh in on the, the overall subject and, and then tell us uh, whether it's good or bad for baseball and for the fans of Boston for a, a family day at the ballpark and a few hot dogs and so it is to cost an awful lot of money to the average American citizen. Well, when we talk about uh, various constituencies in baseball, the, the, clearly the most important constituency is the fan. And, you know, we can debate about the owner's perspective or the player's perspective, but it's the fan's perspective that finally is uh, the most important and often the most uh, overlooked. Uh, we are uh, in the same division as the Yankees, and we're reminded of that every day. So we have to do everything possible to uh, generate more revenues. And uh, we are very revenue-driven, and we're not ashamed of that. Uh, last year, uh, our revenues, um, which was the first year of our stewardship, I think increased quite substantially over uh, the year before that. And we are selling advertising on the Green Monster, and above the Green Monster, we put in seats. And we are increasing the number of concession stands in the ballpark. And we are building out Yawkey Way so that uh, we can bring people to the park earlier. We're spending, we spent $20 million of our own money in uh, ballpark uh, uh, refurbishments. But uh, we hope to uh, get that back in a number of years so that we're not just um, standing pat. And we know that uh, we need to compete uh, uh, with the Yankees' payroll. So in order to have a high payroll, we have to do a lot. And, uh, and uh, one of the things that, um, uh, you know, I agree with, uh, with uh, the, the uh, point of view that good management in the end is the most important. And uh, we inherited a very mediocre farm system. So uh, we uh, are uh, hopefully um, increasing the quality of our scouts and increasing the quality of our front office and, and hopefully this year I think we have uh, I think five picks in the first 60 uh, draft picks I think some it's it's a much higher number than we've had in the past and hopefully we'll make good choices and uh, and uh, that's critical to our, our long-term success but why do we have the highest uh, prices um, in terms of ticket prices in baseball in part because really there's two issues here uh, our, our capacity at Fenway Park is uh, 34,000, and um, there is some debate, by the way, in whether or not that uh, number actually uh, in the supply-demand uh, 
equation actually uh, is a good thing because we do feel that there is great demand every night to go to a Red Sox game. And uh, we, we are always cognizant of the cost of, uh, of tickets. But at the same time, again, in this environment where we're not only competing against uh, uh, other uh, baseball franchises, but we know what the average cost of a ticket is to a, a, a National Hockey League game or an NBA game or a uh, professional football game, we do feel that uh, we're, we're uh, still underpriced. And, uh, you know, $50 was the price that we uh, charged uh, uh, anyone who bought a ticket uh, at the Green Monster for the Green Monster seats this year. Uh, some people might think that's a lot. Uh, we decided to price it low. We decided not to sell it to uh, season ticket holders. And uh, to give you a sense of the demand for that ticket, we put those tickets on sale at 9 o'clock one Saturday morning, and uh, all the tickets for, the, for those seats were sold out by 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, that's in great testament to the, uh, the loyalty that uh, fans have towards the Red Sox. But um, we're certainly aware of, uh, of the um, uh, growing uh, concern. I mean, it's been growing for a long time. Of, of we want to make sure that the average fan can can come to Fenway Park and afford to, to uh, not only bring his family, but to afford to buy concessions. And it's something we talk about. I think we are pushing the limits in, uh, in uh, Boston. And uh, we're going to have to attack this in very creative ways, as, as does anybody who's in the business. Tom, would you like to, to live under a salary cap system in which the Yankees could not spend a dollar more than you could, but the lesser teams in the, in the league and in your division would also, you could not spend more than them? Well, you know, it's a process here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> I've got somebody on my left shoulder saying something, someone on my right shoulder. Um, if you know, and Rob want to confer, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think that uh, it's, healthy, it's healthy for the sport. We, there, there needs to be some regulation. You know, I, I also w work in the television business, and I had the pleasure of uh, sitting next to uh, Congressman Markey at uh, Fenway Park yesterday, and we were talking about um, whether what what I would do, um, given sort of that R Rupert Murdoch now is bidding for control of the uh, of Directv. Um, there there needs to be some regulation, and how that process is is uh, is resolved is something that really is uh, a give and take at the bargaining table, but. You know, there has been an imbalance historically, and, and I think baseball is moving in the right direction. How's that for being politic? <laughs> but let me go back to Rob and, and Gene for a minute and ask about the minor leagues, because Tom mentioned them and other people mentioned them. And I'll have to acknowledge my, my prejudice on this, first of all, because I do own a minority interest in a A-level minor league baseball team. But is it possible that, you know, baseball seems to be different than the other sports in many ways. One is that you have a minor league system, and the other is that you don't have a salary cap. And people do complain about competitive balance. Is the minor league system one of the things contributing to a lack of competitive balance in the sense that if you watch an NFL roster and it gets toward cut time, and if the strongest team in the league, whoever that might be, Tampa Bay this year, cuts a pretty good outside linebacker because he just didn't quite beat out the other guys, some weak team picks him up five minutes later, and he's got a uniform on and he's playing. But if the Yankees cut a third baseman, they send him down to AAA and hang on to him for another two or three years. Is that something, I mean, is it, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? You want to go first? You want me to? I have so much to say about what's been said already. Said already. Yeah, right. again, so <laughs> go ahead. Well, l let me start by saying that uh, free agency is a bad thing. You know, I had an opportunity to work with Lon um, in the late 80s and early 90s, and he was really one of the best we had in baseball. Unfortunately, series of events led him to be a free agent and, and, and then you just heard what he turned into there a minute ago it's very disappointing to me but um you know um, in any event um look i think the the probably the broadest point to be made um in response to your question always a good place to start is that um it is always easy to say um uh, for an owner to say frankly uh, I look at football and I look at basketball and they have salary caps and um, you know people say that those sports have better competitive balance and, and they, they make more money therefore I need a salary cap 
Okay, that would be a good thing to have. But the minor leagues is one example of the problems, the unique features of baseball that make a cap system very, very difficult to have in, in, in our game. Um, the ability to control, manipulate as a result of the, the, the minor league system um, would make the A cap system in, in baseball much more complicated um, than it, it has been in either of the other sports. Um, I think also, you know, our fundamental economics are different enough that, you know, when you have a team that generates $10 million in local revenue like Montreal does, and a team that generates at least 240 or 250 in local revenue like the Yankees do, to say, I'm going to pick a salary cap number that both of those franchises can live with is a very daunting task. Um, I don't think that, uh, frankly, the minor league system on balance has helped on the issue of competitive balance. I think it provides um, lower revenue clubs with an opportunity to control players, develop players in a way, I, I think I agree with a lot of what uh, Arne said about, you know, early buyouts, players being bargains in their early years, and I think that development system Apple actually provides an opportunity for competition. Um, and, you know, frankly, any player with meaningful service when he's sent to the minor leagues usually has an opportunity to become a free agent at that point under our system. I mean, you have to understand all those rules about options and outrights and, and, and those things, but um, I, I don't think that it um, in any way really has been an impediment to the issue of competitive balance. I don't think so. Yet. Let, me, let me deal with three questions, and I'll try to treat them homerically in the sense that I'll, I'll treat them as they were raised but backwards. And that's first is the question of the minor leagues. Um, someone once described the difference between baseball and other sports as the difference between Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. Uh, the other sports have strong federal control, so to speak, a centralized government and the bureaucracy that arises around it um, that exerts great control on the constituent members. But baseball is more or less a, uh, I think Paul Beaster once described it, more like a state's rights kind of an institution, which has strong local interests in each team has always believed it is best able to develop talent on a local level, and therefore the minor leagues are a reflection of that. Many, many efforts to reform the minor leagues have been met with great resistance on the part of certain teams, for example, in the area of scouting. No, 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 let us scout by ourselves. We know how to do it better than the other guy, or gal, <clears throat> for that matter. <clears throat> and um, uh, so that, that culture in the sport has had a, uh, uh, has, I, don't, I don't know which feeds which, but it, it is accompanied by a culture which says, that the unique skills in baseball, which are less you know, measurable or observable in, than in basketball or in football, uh, requires us to take these people out of high school and not have them go to college and train them in the art of playing baseball. And that's why for many years, baseball was really, um, uh, I won't say an enemy, but an adversary of, of, the, of the collegiate development of baseball players. So, but I don't think in terms of, uh, of of, uh, uh, of competitive balance, that is as much problem as a, as a matter of culture. For ticket prices, uh, I must say a word about that. You know, uh, Jay Billis is here. I've been going to the NCAA tournament since 1982, rare exception if I missed it. And those ticket prices keep on going up, but the athletes are free. That teaches you something. When the, when the Florida Marlins literally decimated their payroll, they raised ticket prices. And in and, and, and a refreshing, very, and I mean this sincerely, in a refreshing instance of candor, I didn't want anybody to miss what Tom said, ticket prices are a function of supply and demand. They're not a function of player salaries. Um, uh, player salaries are a function of ticket prices and other streams of revenue. Uh, the um, uh, people charge for tickets what they believe the market will bear. And that's why when team payrolls go down, ticket prices can still go up. Uh, and I don't believe uh, classical economists <clears throat> would disagree with that proposition. I want to, uh, I want to, it might come as a surprise to both Lon and, uh, and, and Arn, but I want to slightly disagree with them about their idea that how money is, while maybe it plays a role, uh, it is not a substitute for a good management. I think there may be a trap in there. It's similar to the trap that a minimum payroll represents. Uh, we, we, are, we live in a society, in a world, actually, which is always searching for meaning. I don't want to get too philosophical about that, but people, people who have this great urge for meaning tend to minimize the importance of sheer, unadulterated, but tremendously profound luck. 
I don't accept the proposition that the management of the Oakland A's is better than the management of the Pittsburgh Pirates or smarter. I think luck plays an enormous role, particularly in a sport with so many variables in it and so many permutations of performance as baseball does. True, Oakland's pitching staff is better than, the, than, than, than Pittsburgh's. That's because they haven't been injured. But the nature of injury sometimes is purely a function of luck. Uh, you've all gone to baseball games where you've seen the illustration of the profound importance of luck. Had Joe DiMaggio's heel been hurting a little bit more, well then the book, The Curse of the Bambino, would not have been written because he wouldn't have come back in the last two games of 1949 and single-handedly overtaken the Boston Red Sox. The Boston Red Sox were unlucky. They weren't stupider than George Weiss. They were unlucky. But it's difficult to subject our lives to the principle of a profound luck. And so we come up with ideas that other guys are smarter than other people. What money does, it is allows you to, mo to moderate the harsh edges of luck. So the Yankees don't have to be as lucky as the next guy. They can afford to be more unlucky than the next guy. And that's, what, that's the role money plays. But do not bite into this notion that the team that wins is smarter than the team that loses. That's a very, very risky proposition from where I said. I don't believe that the successful teams in baseball got there with the solely on the basis of them being smarter. There are lots of smart people in baseball, believe me, who work for franchises that have had absolutely terrible performance. But it isn't because they're not smart. It's because they were subjected, like we all are, to the profound forces of bad luck. Um, Gene's re re reference to the NCAA tournament causes me to come up with one of my other questions down the line here. Maybe I'll ask Paul to get involved in the process here. We've been operating on the presumption up to now that competitive balance is a good thing. I think most of us have thought competitive balance is important. We might try to get there this way or that way, but we think it's a good thing. But in the NCAA basketball tournament, those of us here, I, I think we like competitive imbalance, don't we? Duke, Duke is good most years, and well, like Kansas is good most years, and uh, you know a lot of teams are bad most years. Is it important to a sport to have as much competitive balance as, as a lot of us talk about? Um, yeah, I think it's an important point, and I'm actually going to want to kick it over to Ken. Um, uh, I think it orients people to know certain things, to know that the Yankees will be there, to know that uh, Duke will be there, um, and that it can uh, be a distressing thing for the sport. It certainly was distressing for the sports writers in this last NFL season when they couldn't figure out what was going on, uh, and there were no stories. It, it seemed like it was a series of Gene's lucky events. Um, and uh, that, that it, it became impossible to turn it into a morality tale uh, because everything appeared to be random in every game. Um, so I think that there is actually something um, to, to the value of an imbalance, at least if it's not an imbalance <coughs> that is um, uh, one that causes certain teams to never be in it at all to have nothing to do with it. Or how about rarely rather than never? I would say that the level of excitement, I travel a lot in business, the level of excitement in San Diego the year that the Padres made the World Series exceeded the level of excitement in Atlanta in each of the years that the Braves made the World Series by, I would say, a factor of about 30 to 1. They were sort of bored with success in Atlanta, but we were delighted with success, although I think when you never succeed, maybe you overdo that, uh, although the Cubs... Cubs may demonstrate that you can never succeed and still keep the fans in the ballpark and having a good time. Ken, you want to jump into this one? Well, as far as the idea of competitive balance, everybody points to the NFL as this great model, and it is impossible for anyone in this room, on this panel, to dispute that the NFL is the most envied sports league right now, the most successful sports league. At the same time, that system that they have, to me, does not work as well as it is said to work. And the point Paul made is well taken. People are disoriented all the time. And I live in Baltimore. Ravens, a couple of years ago, won the Super Bowl. And they did it through good drafting and shrewd management and all the things we talk about. Not more than a year after that, they basically had to rip the whole team up. And all of the good decisions that they made, and I'm not a Ravens fan, by the way. I just happen to live there. But all the good decisions that they made came back to haunt them, in a sense, because the players made more money, et cetera, and they could not keep them under the fold. 
I don't think that's a healthy system. And that's the other extreme to me. And it works in the NFL because of this, as Gene was talking about, the difference in fundamental philosophy, fundamental economic systems that exist between the two leagues and others as well. The NFL having this national television contract that dwarfs anything, and that's where the, all the revenue, well, not all, but most of the revenue comes from. That's why it's able to operate that way. I would suggest it is not a good thing. As far as luck, there is luck in baseball. But Tom Werner sits here, and he works for the Boston Red Sox. And the Boston Red Sox, well, the he Boston owns the, Red Sox well they work for him, right. Are they, <laughs> well, they tried really hard. That's true. They, they tried really hard. He represents the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> to hire a guy named Billy Bean this offseason. It was a long and difficult and agonizing process, and there was a good reason why Tom Werner, as one of the owners of the Boston Red Sox, and the others wanted Billy Bean. It is because he has demonstrated consistently an ability to get the most out of his resources. It's an ability that other GMs in other cities simply have not demonstrated. I can think of Pittsburgh and Cam Bonifay when he was there, and I can look at the opposite of that, and that's Terry Ryan in Minnesota. I don't have all my books in front of me, and I can't just point each personnel transaction, but there is a systematic pattern here that is just impossible to deny. Injuries do come into play. There's no question about that, but Oakland was smart enough to draft those pitchers that other teams had a crack at, and I do think that is critical. And again, I think the point of any good league's economic agreement, labor agreement, should be to reward good management and see that that good management is able to sustain success. I'm not suggesting that, that by offering Billy Bean a contract, even the Boston Red Sox were, were, were underestimating the profound importance of luck in their assessment of his talents. All I'm suggesting is that we should not take luck out of the, out of the equation. The, 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 the question of competitive balance is greater in a sport whose revenue tends to drive locally, as it does in baseball. So competitive balance is more important in baseball than it is in football. because. Again, baseball is a, a sport whose principal sources of revenue, for a variety of reasons we need not get into right now, is locally generated. It's, it's a function of local generation. Therefore, in those locales, those, those people, putting aside the mythological uh, you know, uh, uh, franchises like the Red Sox and, and, and the Cubs who seemingly relish their uh, ill fortune over the years going up. You know, uh, and, and, in, and in that, uh, are willing to pay more money for the, uh, to be victimized by that. Um, the, um, uh, putting aside those two franchises, it, it, is more, it is more important that there be competitive balance in baseball because of the nature and the structure and the revenue generation streams uh, that, that exist in that particular sport, I think. Uh, Lon and uh, Arne? Well, one thing I was going to say in response to uh, what Gene said, I think he's absolutely right. But you cannot devise a system where uh, bad luck becomes insurmountable. And that's really what the basketball system is now. Uh, Alonzo Mourning comes down with uh, a kidney ailment. It'll take years for the Miami Heat to dig out from that problem. And nobody would disagree with the contract that they gave to Alonzo Mourning. Uh, Grant Hill, who we all know and love, it, you know, the Magic has suffered because he hasn't been able to play. That was bad luck not bad management. So if you have a system that's unforgiving, uh, I think it, it, um, it makes, it, it doesn't necessarily put a premium on good management and it requires you to do things that are driven solely by the system and not by your own evaluation of personnel and talent. And that takes some of the good management out of it. It becomes management of the cap. Every team in basketball or football as a quote-unquote capologist whose only job is to every day manage the cap. Well, that's far removed from the, from the traditions of the sport where you're evaluating talent. Absolutely right. I agree with that. Arne, went back in. Uh, no, I agree with what Juan said. I don't want to be redundant. But I mean, it is, I think that there's also a difference that we haven't talked about between baseball and basketball and even football and that, um, to me, baseball is the ultimate team game. Um, Basketball, you can be very competitive by having two great players. Obviously, the Lakers are the greatest proof in that. They have two players and, and uh, a, a, a lot of players that may not even start on other teams in the league. Um, in baseball and in football, if you have a great quarterback and a couple key players on defense, you can be very competitive. In baseball, you need pitching. You need you know, a host of players. 
And so the, the strategy, and, and maybe that's where luck, you know, I guess luck can work both ways. With Grant Hill, obviously, an injury to a key player in basketball can change the fortunes of a franchise, you know, forever, like with Alonzo Mourning or Grant Hill in baseball. Uh, there, there, it's, there's, there's a lot more players that you got to put on there because everyone gets in a bat. You need, you need a key nucleus of players to be competitive. The only, my only point was that, get, uh, in re, that why I think management is so important in baseball is in identifying that nucleus. And yes, I agree with what Gene said that the, 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 the money gives you a cushion to, 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 to deal with the bad luck. Like the Yankees can overcome Derek Jeter being out for two months because of their lineup and their great pitching. But if the, the system in baseball is such that teams, if they are, can seize the initiative in a player's career and, um, and the way the economic system works um, and, and sign players if you, and make, hopefully make the right decisions, and I guess that is part of luck, but if you make the right strategic decision in signing players early in their career, you can ensure success and have pretty good runs. The Indians are a great example of that in the 90s. Uh, I think the Mariners are a great example of that. The Angels have adopted that method now. The A's have adopted that method. The Twins, I think, are now doing that. So teams that don't have the economic resources of the Yankees, the system can work because players are, you know, in baseball, you are basically at the team's mercy for the first three years and through the minor leagues. The team can basically set your salary. So teams, by offering players security and multi-year jobs, I mean, multi-year contracts early in a player's career, can buy out those years, give them more money, and buy into their arbitration years and potentially free agent years, paying them more and locking up a nucleus that can give them a run for five, six, seven years and stay competitive. Obviously, they got to stay healthy. That's true for all teams. But the system is such that, it, and teams have made that decision in recent times, and it has worked. And, um, and they've been more competitive than a lot of the teams that have spent just gobs and gobs of money, like the Dodgers. So I do believe that... Um, the baseball system for competition um, uh, and, for, and even in a, in a strange way for competitive balance is better suited than the NBA system. I think the NBA system is so flawed. Um, it's not about who's the best player. It's not about winning. It's all about managing a salary cap. And that, to me, is to the detriment of the product, ultimately. The best illustration of what of Lon's point is, of, of um, Arn's point, is free agency itself. Prior to free agency in 1976 in baseball, the history of baseball was a history of franchise domination over long periods of time by the same teams. That's because the sheer unadulterated reserve clause, an unfettered uh, uh, reserve clause, really was in terms of, 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 of shifts in competitive uh, uh, ability, uh, a bargain with the devil. It said as follows. I have my second baseman, you have yours, you have yours, you have yours, you have yours, and mine goes down. I am now relegated to getting the 17th best second baseman in the world. I can never get the second, third, fourth, or fifth ba second baseman in the world because you have them for life. What free agency did is it came along and it said, you know what? Uh, the third best second baseman in the world is coming up this year for negotiation as a free agent. I'll go after him. It allowed you, in other words, to Pick and choose, if, if you did it judiciously, it allowed you to pick and choose the way to make your team better, unhampered by the lifelong and, and perpetual restrictions of the reserve clause. And what happened? Starting in 1977, 78, the first years where the free agency really kicked in, up until the 1994 strike, you will never find in any sport greater diversity of victory than in baseball over that period of time. That's because free agency liberated the clubs themselves from the bargain they had made with the devil on the question of, uh, of the, the, the application of the reserve clause. The reserve clause is the reason why the Yankees from 1921 to 1964 won all those, the St. Louis Cardinals, the St. Louis Browns. I mean, you know, they, they did play in the World Series in 1945, principally because there was a war going on at the time, or at least, you know, and, 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 and the competitive character of baseball in those years is, for those of you who want to consult the encyclopedia, it's truly, uh, you know, uh, educational in many respects. But uh, the Philadelphia Phillies, the Chicago White Sox, never had a chance because what they, there was no ability for them to get out from the restrictions of the reserve clause that they themselves had imposed on themselves. And, and what the NBA has done, in essence, has through a very, very hard, uh, almost demonic kind of cap system, 
has reinstalled the reserve clause. And that's why you see how difficult it is for franchises to improve when, in fact, hurt by the interposition of luck. You know, it, it is interesting. When I first began in baseball, um, and I would listen to clubs talk about players, um, one of the most difficult impediments to change is the mentality that Gene's talking about in terms of the reserve clause, because clubs would always talk about their players. And, you know, every club thought their guy, right down to the 25th guy, was better than the 25th guy anyplace else. And so on issues like, for example, the salary arbitration for years, um, you know, the clubs talked about salary arbitration, a bad thing. Um, you know, it's uh, some guy gets to tell me what I'm going to pay a player. But when the, where the tide shifts on that issue is when you go to the clubs and say, hey, we can get rid of salary arbitration for you. And we actually got here in, in a little known fact in 1994. It was a bad winter for me, but um, there was a point in time where the deal was available. No more salary arbitration, and what you have to do is you, you got to make the players free. And, I made the offer. <laughs> uh, me personally, I would have made that deal. You know, because I do believe that being out of that arbitration process, putting more players on the market over time, would be a good thing for the clubs. Clubs not prepared to make that deal, um, and they're not prepared to make that deal because I think it's demonstrable that you pay a player less in salary arbitration than you would pay him in free agency, and and you have control over him. You own that player for three more years. So the the, the reserve clause still infects a lot of the, the, the thinking and can be an impediment to change in the industry that might be good for everybody. Horn hit on a point uh, that before I was followed based on what Rob just said, and that is one of the experiences I had in baseball was, the, and I used to handle the salary arbitration cases for the Orioles, it injected into the system sort of a, a, an intellectual quality that doesn't exist in the other sports. Uh, baseball became very much tied into statistical performance and objective measures of success and failure on the field and devised as a result of this arbitration system a set of guidelines for how you measure the market. And Arn made the point quite correctly. We don't have that in basketball. It doesn't really matter what the objective facts are. It matters much more how much money a team has to spend on the salary cap and who happens to be available at that time. And you very rarely get into an act. you try, but you very rarely get into that kind of intellectual uh, exercise of trying to compare the quality of players. And that's, had, that's a very interesting uh, aspect, I think, of the arbitration process in baseball. It has really helped you define the market in very objective terms. And we have to, we do it all the time. We, we get clubs to, in the situation where they're dealing with a free agent player, and they're in this salary arbitration mentality. They're, they're thinking, wow, you know, this guy gets paid that, and his statistics look like this compared to this other free agent. We periodically have to remind them that, you know, in, in this area, you're in the market. It's a question of what somebody else is prepared to pay to that player. You don't have to justify it based on, you know, his performance. One of the things also that's changing right now, and I'm not going to judge exactly what this change in behavior in the market can be called. That's for Rob and Gene. But it's been a very different market this last year in particular, but also really last two years. And teams are now saying with marginal players who are eligible for salary arbitration, we don't want them. We're going to cut them loose. And in effect, what it's resulting in is almost what Rob and Gene talked about, the three-year free agency, because teams aren't holding on to their arbitration-eligible players who they don't want to pay under that system. So it's becoming, I think, more beneficial almost to the small market teams because more players are getting out there on the market. Now, whether this is collusive activity or anything like that, I'm not going to judge, but I'm saying that We're both thankful are, for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just there as well. Are, there are, well, that's for you guys to argue about. But there are more players available to these teams at lower rates than before. And wouldn't either you, can or others, don't, don't you think that's got to have some connection to the new collective bargaining agreement? If you have to pay back money if your total salary goes over 117 million or 125 million or whatever, then maybe you pay for Pedro because Pedro is unique, but you don't pay for a second baseman who bats 282 uh, a ton of money because you find somebody else uh, cheaper. 
Well, I think some of it has to do with that, but even teams that aren't in the Red Sox revenue position are making these kinds of decisions. So to me, it's a change in the economy and a change in the way teams are looking at the system and how to handle it and how to manipulate it. If there's a theme that's been emerging here very powerfully is that each, each of the sports, as it's dealing with this set of problems that they, com they have in common, is responding to their culture. And I want to get to whether you have worked a culture shift with this latest collective bargaining agreement. But uh, at the risk of a heart attack uh, issue here, football really has no long-term player contracts. They have multi-year contracts, which are uh, club option kind of arrangements, which fairly significantly limits some of the impact of luck in the form of injuries or luck in the form of bad judgment. You just cut them. Why has that not happened in the other sports? Well, well my fear is that in, under the current NBA system, we're headed that way. Um, unless reform is taken in the next labor agreement, uh, you're seeing shorter and shorter contracts for NBA players in the aftermath of this latest labor agreement. And this is a sport that has had a tradition of uh, guaranteed multi-year contracts for players. In the NFL, there's never been a history, so they never really gave up much. But in the NBA, there's been a strong history of guaranteed contracts. There's now limits on how long the contracts can go. And now, and since the last agreement, and besides the, just the, 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 the limit on contracts, what's happening because of the cap is that teams are now realizing they can, they, they, they're going to sign players for one or two years where players in the past have gotten multi-year deals, which is bad for player security. In baseball, you come up through a system where the first three years are at the team's control. So you are on non-guaranteed contracts typically for one year at a time. And even through salary arbitration, not only Rob's point that teams typically pay less, you're still on it. If you go to salary arbitration, you're on a one-year one-year non-guaranteed contract. So really, for the first six years, if a team wants to 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 not give a player security of a multi-year contract, they have the ability to lock a player up for six years, going year to year if they want. And that was my point that if a team is smart when in identifying a young star or a player that they want to lock up, they can offer a player a multi security, which to me is the. Um, is what, all, what every player strives for, not just maximizing their, average, their yearly average salary, but it's security and control over one's career are the dominant forces when you're representing a player, what a player is really seeking. That when a team offers security, players will discount um, their potential earnings to achieve security in the form of a guaranteed, a guaranteed contract that would protect them in the event they got hurt or disabled or they lost their skill. So. I think the baseball system, and obviously when you get to free agency, then typically free agents, uh, you know, by and large, get you know multi-year guaranteed contracts. But I don't think it's just football. Um, my fear is that in the cap system, and the NBA has been, is now you can see it happening. The signs are there that in any cap system where teams have to make choices on players, and there is a limited pot of money and resources that ultimately players are going to suffer, that contracts are going to become shorter, guarantees aren't going to be there. And we're seeing that involved now in the NBA. And, that's, and, and to me, that is very sad for a league, for, for, for players who for, for, were, the, were the, the leader in having security and having long-term contracts um, over recent years that has really dramatically decreased. And I think it's only going to decrease unless there is some adjustments made to this agreement. Other comments? I do think the, the culture point that, that you made is an important one, and I do think the culture in the, the, the game has changed. Um, certainly in the period of time I was been involved, I was just making a list here. I was thinking about when Tom bought the first time, and when you came back, I think on my list, if you count AOL and Turner as the same thing, which is sort of hard to do, I believe, you, even if you count them in, I think there are only seven owners that are the same as when you came in the first time. Um, so there, you know, you're talking about a, a completely different set of you know, either businesses or individuals that are in the game and they're very different people than they were in you know, 1990. 
Um, I think equally important, um, the people that are selected to run these teams today look different than the people that were selected as general managers um, 15 years ago. Uh, they are much more likely to be managers, negotiators, college and or beyond educated as opposed to talent evaluators. And you know, a talent evaluator is much more likely to fall in love with you know, his second baseman than is somebody who is a professional manager. And I think the third thing that has happened to the culture is that the combination of the economy that, that you know, what this new agreement means, or even the last one, will be colored by the fact that the economy is so different now than it was five years ago. And the combination of the economy and the new system has put all clubs under some form of stress. For the big markets, they're looking at, you know, am I going to be paying a tax? I got to come up with 25 million additional dollars in revenue sharing. And that impacts, you know, as wealthy or high revenue as the team may be, that puts them under stresses that they've not had to manage before. And then, of course, the smaller markets have the nagging problem of even with the revenue sharing, is it affordable? Am I making the right allocation of resources. And so the game, it is very different out there culturally. People think about how they're putting their teams together differently than they did 15 years ago. I, I want to thank Rob for that insight into what the opening paragraphs of his brief is going to be. Um, <laughs> the, uh, no, I'm not suggesting that there's actually going to be a game. I, 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 I truly do not know. Uh, I, um, I think that's pretty that, good, though, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it, was good. it was excellent. It typically is. Thank you. Um, the, uh, it's a subject that we don't have enough time to get into in depth. It, 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 it commands, but it, it, it's worth some mention um, of. Uh, a, lurking within what Rob is talking about, though, is a very, very serious question that's going to have a long-term impact uh, starting in around 2006 in the sport, and that is this. Back in 1994, a large measure of the problems we faced, uh, I hearken back to what uh, a very distinguished negotiator in Major League Baseball, at least for the Anheuser-Busch people and the St. Louis Cardinals, Stu Meyer, is not with us anymore, but a uh, really good man, sharp guy, described the two different kinds of negotiations and collective bargaining as XY negotiations, in which I'm talking about this and you're talking about that and, you know, we're talking on these two different levels. Uh, I want heightened free agency. You want a salary cap. This twain never shall meet. And I think one of the, the principal reason why there was no uh, um, uh, labor disruption in, t in, in 2002, and I don't say it because he's here, I said it publicly uh, behind his back, is in large <laughs> measure a tribute to, uh, to, to Rob's effort to make the negotiation in 2000 an XX negotiation. All we, we're not talking about a cap. We're talking about revenue sharing. That's already in the agreement. And we're talking about taxes already in the agreement. It's an XX negotiation. We can have disagreements about how big X should be but we are at least speaking the same language. In that, though, there is an assumption, and that is, which we bought into, and that is that the tax is, in fact, not a synonym for the salary cap. See, there are two kinds of taxes, taxes which are collected and taxes which are meant never to be collected because they are so onerous. And if it turns out that the tax that we agreed to, on the assumption it was an X and not a Y, is, in fact, the salary cap, well, the harbinger is there. If, in fact, it turns out to be an X, we'll have a, ne a negotiation next time about X and X again. But that's the, that's the crucial question. All, all collective bargaining negotiations, as Professor Siegel knows this better than anybody, all are informed by their prior histories. Every collective bargaining agreement learns from the agreement that went before it. I will tell you as a brief anecdote. The last people involved in the 1990 negotiations to stop the lockout were his former boss, Chuck O'Connor, and me, and two other people. And when we literally came to the final agreement, I heard all this screaming and yelling coming out of the commissioner's office. And in the commissioner's office, there was the commissioner and six owners on the executive council. As I walked out of the room with Mark Belange, I said, the next one is going to be tough. Because I knew that that last deal we had made had left a lot of bad ill will on their side. And the, so the 1994 negotiation was informed by the 1990 negotiation. Well, the 2000 negotiation, 2001, 2002 negotiation, was informed by 1994, 5, and 6 negotiation. But I can assure you the 2006 negotiation will be informed by what happens over the course of the 2002 agreement. 
<clears throat> well, I've got about 12 more questions, which we couldn't cover by five, but uh, I think we ought to see if the audience has some questions that they would like answered for a brief period of time. So do we have volunteers, questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. You started alluding to the fact that the NFL system is so dramatically different from all the others. Can you maybe elaborate on the reasons why there is more of a competitive balance? Is it an economic factor, or is it um, the length of the contracts that you started to mention? The NFL has a hard cap. And the way the system works is, and I've just tipped my toe into this this year, uh, is basically substitute the guaranteed contracts, they pay signing bonuses. And so once that signing bonus is paid, there's no more commitment to the player, in essence. And as a result, and it's what, it's what Ken alluded to, teams turn over every year, and there comes a date upon which they have to be below this hard cap number, and they have to manipulate their roster to accomplish that. So it's a, it's a very different system than the NBA system. Well, the NBA system now has a hard cap component to it, so the NBA really has the worst <coughs> possible system. We've got a soft cap with a hard cap on top of it. Uh, to contrast uh, organized sports, we'll say regular labor uh, the one that Senator Wagner, Wagner had in mind. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> Not <laughs> us. Mysterious uh, ingredient, which I'd like to comment on. To what extent does ego, or whatever you want to call it, if it's not a nice word, you call it ego, is it just if you say a more pro or whatever you want to call it, play in the collective bargaining situation in organized athletics? It's very different, I think, in the commercial. I assume it plays some role. Uh. You know, I, uh, I did a lot of bargaining outside of sports um, when I was in private practice. Um, I, I think, I, I guess the way I think about that issue, it's, it's really what it is, is public relations. Things, you could call it a more public yeah, I mean, I, I think a good rule of thumb when you're bargaining, when you're doing a nurse's contract or a contract with truckers is the minute you're in the paper, it, you're making a mistake. Um, and you know, I sort of brought that traditional thinking with me to this, but you, you, you can't do it. it the, the press will not allow it to happen because of the level of interest in the game. And as a result, there is this overlay of not, you, you have to manage not only what you do in the room, and Gene and I in particular spent a lot of time doing this this summer, you have to manage the messages that you're putting out and making sure that you don't create conflict between the bargaining parties is not as a result of what you've done in the room, but as a result of what you've said about what you've done in the room later on. Um, so, so it is more complicated. And then obviously, I think to get right to your point, to the extent that the press is writing about it every day, people's egos do become invested in it because it's not that, gee, they got the better of that deal. It is, gee, they got the better of that deal, and every sports page in America is writing about it today. So, the, you know, it does complicate the process, I think. But not as much as the sports writers, I think, would otherwise have you believe. You know, they talk in terms about one of the reasons the parties can't come to an agreement is because they don't get along with each other, or this guy doesn't like that gal, or vice versa, or this guy doesn't like that guy. <laughs> that is so overrated. I yeah, mean, I agree I, with you that. know, the illustration I always give is, is you know, you, you get. Whoever that person might be in the world that I dislike the least, I can read what he or she writes. If it's a good proposal, I'll accept it. If it's a bad proposal, they could, you know, Mother Teresa could be making it, but doesn't doesn't change that the fact. Uh, um, the uh, the personality issue is vastly uh, overstated, and it's vastly overstated because of who covers the sport. Um, it's a tough job being a sports writer, but the culture of sports writing is that there's, a big, there's an opening and an end and a winner, and somebody's taking the lead as you get into the eighth inning or whatever right. it might be. That kind of uh, structural uh, uh, intellectual analysis uh, is, is very, very damaging to collective bargaining in sports. But in the final analysis, it's the words on the paper that make the deal, not who gave it to you. That's irrelevant. But at the same time, Gene, I, I know you'd agree with this. There's a history of distrust here. It's well documented. <laughs> it's well justified on both sides to some extent. And doesn't that color what goes on? Well, the distrust makes you read what's written on the paper with a <laughs> more careful eye. But it's still what the words on the paper are. But, but you, can, you can broaden the question out, I think. Uh, I mean, uh, one could ask, why do football, basketball, and baseball have such different labor arrangements? Is there something inherent in the sport? Is it that baseball plays every day and football plays once a week? Is it minor leagues? Is it something else about 
the sport, or is it the history of the people? Is it that Marvin Miller was there, and this uh, guy was there, and that guy was there, and one union was strong, I, one I, union I was weak? I have a theory about this. I bet, the, I bet we have five or six theories, I but you can part start. Of the theory I have about it is the history of the sport. Uh, baseball was always a solid economic endeavor with rich owners that didn't have to cooperate with each other. In the early years, football, uh, they were desperate to make the thing go, and there was a spirit of cooperation that I think grew from the beginning. And so the idea of sort of centralized government and revenue sharing and all of that was, you know, it was all for one, one for all. I don't know that you had that same culture in baseball. Now, I'm not as good a baseball historian as Gene, but I think that's my general sense of the difference between those two sports. Again, for, I, prof, I, you'll keep on asking these questions that I've actually given speeches and written articles about, but Professor Siegel will, will bear me out on this too, I think. The, the most important ingredient in a labor union is the ability of members to rely upon each other. Um, when, uh, when Mark McGuire is home on strike, he knows one thing for sure. Oral Hershiser is not going to work. Doesn't have to talk to him. Doesn't have to even know the fellow. He knows he's not going to work because baseball players do not go to work during strikes. All the agreements in basketball and football until the last one were negotiated by lawyers as settlements in, in, in antitrust cases. Suits negotiated their collective bargaining agreements so that Joe Montana never had an opportunity or a tradition to learn, out of which he could learn that Tony Dorsett was not going to work. The ability of those unions to develop a historical emphasis on collective bargaining, which in turn would give grow to the principle of reliance upon each other, is just lacking. And so it's not Marvin Miller or Don Fear. It's certainly not Gene or is it? It's not you know, the minor leagues or the, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with Again, a cultural phenomenon, but I think it has to do with the fact that, you know, uh, in 1994, we had a strike. Clubs opened camp a month early. 1,200 players in the bargaining unit. Strike was 234 days, and not one player went to camp. Not one. People went to camp at River Rouge. But baseball players didn't go to work. Um, and part of that is because it's just part of the culture. Baseball players don't go to work during a strike, period. End of story. But that starts with Marvin, doesn't it? Uh, in, in part, but I, you know, again, giving personalities as opposed to <clears> forces, <throat> all this, you know, this, this, this significance is nice. It makes you, you know, makes for interesting reading, but I think it's more profound than but that. But there are, there are things even beyond both of those, and I don't disagree with what Gene said, but when you talk about lawsuits, remember, baseball has an antitrust exemption. Nobody else We changed a little bit. Has. Right baseball has basically has an antitrust exemption. The result in the history, and you guys correct but me if I'm wrong, the history is baseball had the toughest reserve clause, the slowest free agency of any sport, and when they got it in the Messersmith and other arbitrations, they kind of went from zero to ten on a scale of ten quickly, and they've sort of been moving back off of that ever since, whereas football and basketball kind of marched toward free agency in a, in a smoother way. If you track... The, the freedom of player movement in the sports, I think you find there a very is, different pattern in baseball than you do in the other two sports. There is something to the idea that, that our bargaining relationship was different because we missed that trade of free agency for kind of aggregate cost control as reflected in, in, in the cap. And I do think that there's something to it. Um, but I think there are things about our players that are different. Um, I, I, and I do believe it goes beyond Marvin because obviously it lasted for a very long time after Marvin was gone. But um, you know, our players come through the minor league system together, um, in large part. I mean, there, you know, there's the exception to that rule. Um, playing in the minor leagues is difficult. It is an opportunity for people to, you know, kind of band together. They, they form ties. Uh, by the time we get them, my unbroken experience since 1989 has been they are great unionists. I mean, compared to any union in the world, they are honest to God, good unionists. They hang together. And I think that in, in other sports, you have sh people who arrive, you know, after college or at least part of college. Um, it's a very different way that they come into the game. They, they come into the game having been formed in a different way. And I just don't think any of those unions, partially as a result of their leadership, ha have ever been able to rely on the fact that they, if they had to put them on the street, uh, that they were going to be on the street for the period of time that it would take to achieve you know, a workable agreement from their perspective.
Other questions from the audience? Back there. Um, I was just wondering um, if you could comment on the NBA. Uh, and you mentioned how the pendulum had swung towards the management. And I was wondering whether there was any way that that would sort of shift back or how, you know, are, are uh, agents and other uh, people on the labor side going to yeah, help that swing backwards? Well, oh. so it's a follow up. I think a dramatic difference. And I, I agree with everything that Gene said just before, um, as I often do. <laughs> I have to. Um, I wouldn't be in business if it wasn't for Gene. But um, I think there are NBA players versus baseball. In baseball, there's a great history of sacrifice. When players come into the minor leagues, they learn and appreciate what all the players have done for them, not just the union, what the players have done, sacrificed. Uh, along the way, and they understand that they may be called upon at some point to make an equivalent sacrifice, and they accept that. <clears throat> in basketball, I, I don't do football, so I really can't speak for it, but I think football is similar to basketball, and I think it is a, all the labor gains have been through litigation historically in basketball and football. There's never been that same uh, tradition of sacrifice. Um, basketball players are very strong individually and weak collectively. I think they're much stronger individually than baseball players. Basketball players would hold out a year to negotiate a player contract for himself. But if it came to working together uh, to, to get a better labor agreement, uh, I think last time they showed they were willing to sit for a while, but that was really the first time. And, and it was very difficult to hold the players together. Um, I think it's going to be very, I'm very pessimistic about the future. Uh, maybe it's my age, uh, uh, and um, but I, I'm not optimistic at all about basketball going forward as far as players. Uh, I think the agreement is 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 so terrible now, um, and I and I don't see any sign that the NBA. They always talk about well, Mark Cuban, and there's a few owners that don't like paying the tax, and they want to compete. Uh, I think there's the, the owners. So much follow lock and step what Commissioner Stern wants and what's going on in New York. And, and the overwhelming majority, it's all about money, saving money, uh, that I don't see the prospects for change. In addition to that, what makes it tough is that the union, historically, where in baseball there's been a genuine partnership and support from the union uh, in supporting agents and players through education and uh, helping agents do the best job in representing players in baseball. In basketball, we've had a history of not cooperating. The union is threatened by agents. And, um, and there's a, so where the union would be smart to embrace us, to use us, to help communicate their message, um, over the recent times, it just hasn't worked that way. And I think it ultimately undermines their credibility with the players, and it hurts us. And it hurts our ability to effectuate change going forward. And, um, and everything has been about, um, and, and as, so as we address these issues, and they're serious issues, um, Gene talked about an interesting thing in negotiations about seeing X and X versus X and Y. In negotiations, typically there's what they call positional bargaining, where one says X and one says Y, and, and you move very slow in increments, and it's protracted and acrimonious, and you move back and forth. What was interesting in the, in, the, in the last baseball negotiation is that they sort of tackled a problem as problem solvers, identified what was wrong with the system, and viewed it, as Tom said, as a process that they were trying to come to some agreement, almost like two judges working together to, to try to fix a system. They, were, they weren't adversaries. They came at it more from a similar perspective and trying to tackle a problem. Looking at it at its merits, you know, what were the issues? Well, let's try to, you know, tackle this difficult issue. In basketball, it's X and Y. It's salary cap, no free agency, controlling players. And it's players basically in a situation where you're dealing with, they say, millionaires versus billionaires, billionaire owners, that you're dealing with the all-powerful body here that is not willing, not willing one bit to look at the merits of the issue. It's all about getting their way and imposing their will on the players. And in that system, you can only negotiate a deal if you can come up with another alternative. 
And what are those alternatives? The alternative is to strike. And in the last agreement, when we go back, as, we, as Gene says, you're shaped by the history of labor negotiations. As you go forward in basketball, you can look at what ha the results of last time. And the players, when we get into these discussions, the players are going to look at the strike. They sat out longer than ever before in basketball. They sat out to midseason. And, and, and they were starting to crack. And that's why they ended up making a deal. And what did they get? They got the worst system ever. Hard cap, individual cap, rookie cap, tax, escrow, everything to make it basically no options for players. So one of the interesting questions going forward is how do you develop an alternative to making to doing a traditional negotiation? And then the, so the question will come up in this one. In basketball, has the union outlived its purpose? Has the union now gotten to a, this will be the one, this will be the threshold question. Has the union, because none of these rules would be legal, but for the fact that the union's agreeing to them. All these caps, the draft, taxes, escrows, all these things wouldn't be legal, but for the fact that there's a union agreeing to them. So the question's gonna come up now is, if we're now dealing with the all-powerful body that's not willing to look at the merits of the situation and address the imbalance that's going on in the NBA, if, if David Stern is not willing to do that, and he's just going to continue to impose his will, his rule by fiat, by what he wants, what he believes is best, and we can't tackle the merits, and it's positional bargaining, and positional bargaining means the league is not going to move, in the end, and the players are just going to keep making concessions. Then the question is, well, and if, and if a strike isn't going to achieve its purpose, because that's the traditional other alternative, then the, 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 the last question remains is maybe the only way to do it is not just to use it as a negotiating ploy, but maybe the union has outlived its purpose. Maybe it's now time that, because this is a, is a league of superstars, a league of stars, and maybe because they're so powerful individually, maybe it is now time in this sport to look at this from a different vantage point and look at it, let's let, let everyone just negotiate their own deals. Let's take away all the legal protections that the league has. And you know what? I don't believe David Stern would want that. I don't believe he would want that for a second. And the question is, do the players have the guts to do that? Do they have the ability to see it through and say, this may be the option to, what, you know, to, to changing and, and maybe swing the pendulum back to having some, you know, a more fair balance going forward? And that's my own view. I worked at the NLRB for 12 years. And for those of you who've taken labor laws, you may be familiar with the process of decertifying a union. Well, all the decertification cases I ever saw, and there were thousands of them, I never once saw what happened in basketball when the players tried to decertify the union. And that was management sending concords <laughs> to Europe to bring in potential voters against the decertification. <laughs> um, that's a anecdotal evidence, obviously, but it is some evidence of the, uh, of the correctness of, uh, of, uh, Alon's, of uh, Arn's point of view. Lon, you want to weigh in on the NBA? I think we're, I, you know, one of the mistakes you can make as a negotiator is over, overplaying your hand. And if you have the, if you have the leverage and you have the power, uh, disrespecting your adversary, and I think that's what's happened in basketball. David Stern took advantage of a new uh, head of the union and a weak union body, and he so overplayed his hand that he may have caused draconian results. And I, I, I couldn't agree with where Arn is headed uh, any more than that. I think he put it very, very uh, eloquently. Uh, Arn's comment reminded me of something that we discussed way back in 1973 when we had the first sports law course taught at this law school, which was a question for Gene, really, is uh, how do you have, how do you run a union, and how do you administer a union when you have superstars and you have rookies? It's very different than a union of electricians or whatever, and obviously uh, you've succeeded. You're, when you guys walk, they all walk, and I think we all, we all accept what you said, and it's part of your power, and I think what Arn and, and Lon are saying is that the NBA has, has, has at least partially, if not totally, failed at accomplishing the same purpose. There is actually internally what's called the Orzo rule on this subject. Really, it is. Uh, it goes back to what happened in 1985, and it really was an il a good illustration of how, if you think things through, you can see the interconnectedness of, uh, within your bargaining unit. In 1985, the Players Association gave up a year of salary arbitration. Salary arbitration used to be two years of service. It then became three years of service. Um, it did it in large measure because well, a substantial number of free agents who said, I'm beyond free salary arbitration. What do I care? Why, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll go on strike if you want us to, but gee, this just sounds silly. I got eight years in, in the business. 
So we agreed to it. We had some other benefits, obviously. 1985 was a pretty good negotiation for us, I think. But on balance, though, it was a, a deal that both parties thought was fair, uh, or at least the best deal that they could reach under the circumstances. Uh, the new rules went into effect two years later, starting in the salary arbitration season of 1987, and you started noticing something. The number of players who had zero years of service to three years of service increased by an enormous percentage. Why? Because players be with two years to three years of service had become, by virtue of the loss of their rights to salary arbitration, more valuable to the clubs. <coughs> now, in a fixed bargaining unit of 40 contracts per, per club, when the membership's no number is static, where did those jobs come from? They came from free agents. So to the extent that there were free agents out there who thought that what happened to the salary arbitration eligible players didn't matter to them, guess what? It mattered profoundly to them. And it's given birth to the Orza rule, which is that you cannot allow the clubs to make any individual class of players less valuable than they currently are, because to the extent you do, somebody else is going to lose their job because of it. So you all have your stake in this together. And that rule really does have a lot of persuasion among the player core that uh, there is, uh, when, when you allow the clubs to single out a particular group of players and make them more valuable to the club by decreasing their, their, their own internal value, what you do is you make them more valuable and other people lose jobs because of that because the bargaining unit is fixed as 1,200 members at all times. Uh, I want to go back to where, we, to where we started, which is if, if we accept, and maybe we don't, that the Yankees might lose 30 million bucks this year, and if we accept that uh, the business of baseball oh, I got some cash now. I get a is, hat, is partially in right now. Come on. <laughs> it's going to talk. Come on. <laughs> and if we accept, at least for sake of argument, Gene, that the business of Why baseball is somewhat to broken. Why discuss subject? That's obviously preposterous. Here, 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 here's, <laughs> the question, here's the question on whatever premise you okay, want it. Okay. Here's the question. You said about 45 minutes ago, supply and demand. Classical economists would tell you that Tom's ticket prices are generated by supply and demand. Now, if Tom's ticket prices are generated by supply and demand, and if the, con the salaries of the free agents are generated by supply and demand, uh, how can this many teams be losing baseball? I am not an economist, but it seems to me an economist would say that the free agent market and the ticket market and the TV market all ought to normalize themselves out over a period of two or three or four years to the point where an average team is making a few bucks or breaking even and a successful team is making a lot of money and there's always losers in every market so whether we're talking about widgets or baseball teams there ought to be more winners and less losers is in baseball so which part which part of the system is not operating on supply and demand three words improvidently acquired debt You want to elaborate? <laughs> oh, don't ever ask that question to him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, please, take it from experience. <laughs> I mean, please. I handed you a golden opportunity. You, know, you, don't want, you, know, you don't want more from me. That, that's what it is. It's improvidently acquired debt. They, they go into the hole thinking that the hole that they're digging will be filled by the greater revenue, the marginal product that, that, that the, the, the debt is designed to uh, produce. It, and it doesn't. <laughs> that's how a team loses money. The team invests ten million it otherwise doesn't have, and it produces twelve. They made money. So well, I would just like to say yeah. that that the system. I mean, now I'm going to answer it when I when I was responsible for running the Padres, because it was impossible to break even and be competitive. Um, exactly. That in 1992, when we uh, had a a team that uh, was uh, five or six all stars, there was no scenario that we could make money and be competitive. We could be one or the other, but we couldn't be both. Now, you know, the, the, the reason that I came back into baseball is that the Red Sox are a very different proposition than the San Diego Padres, and they have a loyal fan base, and, uh, and you know, in any given year, you've got, because you also, uh, we purchased a, uh, a ballpark, and we are also a majority owners in a, a cable network, there is other other things beside the baseball team to uh, tie us over in bad years. But the system in San Diego was, now that you say, well, why would you buy into it? And I mean, that's a, that's a complicated question because uh, people who um, invest in a baseball team are often doing it for non-economic reasons, but, but it was impossible to do both. Yeah, unless you acquired a lot of debt you didn't want to acquire, 
if that debt had borne fruit, that's one thing. But if, in fact, it puts you in the hole, you're in the hole. So you could lose $30 million. This theoretical club that's in sports business. <laughs> yeah. one, more, one more question from the uh, audience. Do you have a question? <laughs> yes, sir. In, in light of your comments on what we're seeing in the NHL, well, why haven't there been more either uh, threatened or actual bankruptcies uh, even going to affect the negotiating position of the parties? Ban well, bankruptcy for a, from a club and from Major League Baseball's so the commissioner's office perspective is a very sort of troubling thought. Um, the uh, loss of control that takes place in a bankruptcy proceeding is profound. I mean, the idea that a team files for bankruptcy and that team can be sold outside the you know the guidelines and, and and you know sort of desires uh, of the other 30 teams I mean it could be a way that you end up with a third team in a market which would cause um, obviously some substantial dislocations in the sport um, I think that the other thing uh, that has been true uh, is that most people uh, when they and it, it harkens back to something that Tom and I had a little exchange about in terms of the number of new owners in the game. People have sold franchises when they get to the point that, you know, I can't, I don't want to have these losses anymore. And um, for a substantial period of time, you could make the argument that they sold them at appreciated prices that got them somewhere closer to whole. Um, what's disturbing about where the game is now is that uh, there seems to be some stagnation in that appreciation of franchise values and there's a lot more debt on the clubs than there's ever been historically so this ability to get yourself out by selling the club is problematic and we have thought long and hard about you know bankruptcy was not a topic that consumed a lot of our time at one point and it is one that we have thought long and hard about particularly in light of the the, the things that have gone on in the nhl uh, but I still think even in a situation where, you know, bankruptcy was sort of the uh, route of choice uh, for the individual owner that I, I think there would be league issues that you try to finesse that because of this control problem. There were substantial liabilities that might arise to the players in that area. It's a very complicated question. Bankruptcy is, bankruptcy is like, you know, capital punishment in terms of an interlocking sport like baseball, I think. That's a serious, real serious issue. I think we might have time for just one round of final comments. If anybody has anything they want to say they haven't had a chance to say, Lon, we'll start at your end and work our way around. Uh, no, I think we've covered the topics, and, and I look forward to Gene and Rob solving all the problems. <laughs> Jim? Yeah, right. I echo that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've uh, said enough this words? afternoon. Gene, you've hardly, I, said, course, you hardly said a word. Do you want to get one more <laughs> chance to talk? Yeah, uh, most of you are law students, so I want to give you some hope for the future, and I want to use a baseball reference to do it. Uh, we talk very seriously about baseball a lot of times, but we have to keep our perspective. In 1980, Mickey Rivers was given... Uh, an Esquire Dubious Achievement Award for something he said, and I, 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 I you know, suggest that you adopt it as your, as your, your, your way of living, your modus vivendi. He was asked uh, how he could be so calm in real life when he was so jittery at the plate, and he said, well, that's because uh, there ain't no use worrying about all the things you got control over, because so long as you got control over them, there ain't no use worrying. And there ain't no use worrying about all the other things you don't got control over. Because so long as you don't got control over them, there ain't no use worrying. <laughs> <laughs> so you just remember that. You, you walk on your Arn, final, Arn, final words. Paul, Tom? Well, I would just like to quote another player that things in baseball are not quite as they seem. And, you know, you go to Duke Law School and you try to figure out things uh, by logic and common sense. And uh, a year ago, I was having lunch with uh, Ricky Henderson, and this was about uh, <laughs> two days after um, Ken Caminetti had written an article in the Sports Illustrated about the fact that 50% of all Major League Baseball players were using steroids. And Larry Lucchino and I happened to be having lunch with him, and we said to him, Ricky, is this possible that 50% of, of all Major League Baseball players use steroids? And Ricky said, well, I don't use steroids, so that's 49% right there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, we'll take a break now. Uh, in light of the discussion, uh, I just uh, wish that when I had joined Duke Law School 
I, I had had Gene as the, the counsel to the, the faculty because when I joined Duke Law School, I was paid more than a third of the New York Yankees. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't want to think about what it is now. <laughs> but we'll have a half an hour break and then resume.